Oh, wait, you don't know where to look. I'm on the floor. I'm here. Hi, online church. Hi, church. Um, I figured that tonight we might do things a little bit differently. Is that okay? We might mess it up a bit, which I think is quite fun. So um, we're going to start as you take your seats. What I'm looking for is do you yell out your last name as loudly as you can while you're taking your seat? Gary? Gary? Louder, yell your last name. Online, what is your last name? Hey, you are not Langton. I can hear a whole lot of last names. If I was yelling out my last name, you would think I would yell out Langton, but my original last name is this. Wallace! Yes, I hear that over there. And my coat of arms means for freedom. Oh, so guys, I grew up with Daryl Wallace. He is the original owner of our clan. And the truth is, I was pretty embarrassed growing up with Daryl Wallace. Don't tell him he is sitting over there. Um, But we would go to parties or weddings, and he would feel the need to wear some Wallace tartan when he went to things because he was so proud of his Scottish heritage. And I grew up listening to these stories about my ancestors and how amazing they were and all the kinds of things that people in my family had done. And to be honest, my sisters and I would sit at the table and we would roll our eyes as he told the stories. Until 1995, when something incredible happened. I think the guys have got a photo. A movie came out, Braveheart about Sir William Wallace. Guys, this was my great, 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 I don't know how many great, grandfather. Wow. And he's incredible, right? And so I was kind of impressed for a little while about this. But when Rich and I went to Edinburgh after we were married, and we were walking around the streets of Scotland, we went to the military tattoo and we were talking to somebody and they said to us, what's your connection to Scotland? And I said, I'm a Wallace. And the response in that moment was astounding. Like the guy starts hugging us and offering to buy us beer and meals and whatever we might want. We don't drink, just by the way. But he also said, thank you for saving the Scottish throne. And I said, you're welcome. (laughs) Being a Wallace was pretty awesome. It meant something. But I married Rich, (laughs) which is also a very good thing. And he is a Langton. And apparently the Langtons have their own history that they are very proud of. They signed the Magna Carta. There is all this stuff that they did in their family that apparently I should be very, very grateful to take on the name Langton. To be honest with you, I found it very hard to give up my surname and to swap. But when we did... We got to forge this new family together and we got to take the best of what it meant to be a Wallace and the best of what it meant to be a Langton and we melded it together into our new reality and our new family. And sometimes it was easy and sometimes it was difficult, but it means something to be a Langton. Now, if you're in here tonight and you have become a Christian, we all got into God's family We all found a sense of belonging in God's family and that means something. Bearing the name Christian means something. It says in Ephesians 2, 19 to 22, you are now no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith has become your home country. Don't you love that? This kingdom of faith is our home country. You are not strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name of Christian as anyone. God is building a home and He is using all of us, regardless of how you got here, in what He is building. First, He used the apostles and the prophets for the foundations, but now He is using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. Do you know the church is God's new humanity, His new reality, and we all got in. If you're a Christian here tonight, it means that you are part of God's family. It means that you are here being transformed by Him into the likeness of Jesus Christ. 
This is a good thing. And if you are here tonight, you are now no longer an outsider, but you're an insider. You got in on the greatest story known to all mankind. And if you're sitting here tonight and you go, I don't actually feel like I belong like that, then I wanna tell you the Bible says that that's an absolute lie. That whether you feel like you belong or you don't belong, you have as much right as anybody else to the name of Christian, that you belong here. If you wanna belong, you can belong. Jesus makes sure that you find a place where you belong. But the truth is, just like being a Wallace means something, just like being a Langton means something, Christian means something. We look a certain way, we act a certain way. And Christians throughout history who have lived their faith well, have stood out because of their connection to Jesus. They say about Martin Luther King that his commitment to radical love had everything to do with his commitment to Jesus of Nazareth. That's hard guys, say that one, Nazareth. Say it, come on, say it. It's not as easy as it sounds. The truth is that when you choose to become a Christian, They will know us by our love is what the Bible says, but also by other things that God produces fruit in us in keeping with the Holy Spirit's work. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, kindness, self-control. We're meant to stand out and look totally different. And when we walk in step with Jesus and when our lives start falling into line with His, transformation happens. And we see disciples who go from being like cowards and they can't get out of an upper room to being so confident and they're brave and they're bold. And guys who are arrogant and who are absolutely out of line, going to be the most humble servants who start building the church into some beautiful community. Yeah, this transformation starts happening. And I reckon if you're here, many of you have that story. But I am looking for Al Lindley. Where do I find him? Al Lindley, you don't know I'm coming to do this, but I felt like we should just go off the grid for tonight. So Al Lindley and I, we've become quite good friends lately. And um, (sighs) Yellow Tribe. Um, So I wanted to ask you a question because you became a Christian out of a non-Christian family. Is that right? Do you want to stand up and talk to me or do you not want to? Hi. (laughs) You're killing me, Cass. Yeah, but our church love it. So Al is one of our pastors here on staff, but he also, how did you find Jesus? I was very lucky. I was in uh, Parramatta. Uh, (laughs) Which my daughter's ashamed of me because I only went to year 10 and uh, they went to year 12. But... um, uh, a beautiful lady named Yvette Jaliri uh, was doing street team. So like, she was witnessing uh, on the streets and we were all partying at the end of year 10. And then she came and picked us up for church every Sunday for four weeks. Hold on, you can't sit down yet. So <laughs> did you meet Jesus immediately? No, I went probably every Sunday with Yvette for about four weeks. Um, sort of just... Never been to church ever in my life, and that was back in the day when there was a lot of funny things going on down the front as well. So there was a lot of Holy Spirit moving, and everyone's falling over, and you know, doing all the Holy Spirit stuff. So um, it was really, really different for me because I'd never grown up in that, and our family were totally different. Um, and um, so it probably took me about four weeks or so, but um, but when I fa- finally did, um, it was just something that I. Um, like you just can't imagine how great it is because it's like you feel that love of God for the first time, um, and which I'd never felt before in my family, and which is, um, you know, as growing up, sometimes we've got different families. And, yeah, just that love of God that you, I've never felt in my life before, and that was back in the day when we stood up and we all walked down the front as well. And what changed for you? Well, everything changed because the way I did life and the way I dealt with my emotions and I had a big chip on my shoulder. I um, was angry, Uh, my parents were divorced. Um, So I had to try and figure out what my next season was gonna be. And I was really, really, really lucky that I had a great youth group and and Donna Crouch was our um, youth leader. Darko Koljak was our first youth leader, if somebody remembers Darko. 
But um, and you got, had guys like Phil and Lucinda, obviously, and and Darren, and um, you know guys like Bruce Williams, and um, you know Steve Crouch used to take us out water skiing and things like that. Just because we were young and we just didn't know how to deal with our emotions, and they were the ones that taught me how to do life, not so much my parents. Did your family notice a change? Yeah, my mum thought I was a bit weirdo because um, <laughs> I was going to this church and, and everyone's really huggy as well, you know, and they've, they, you know, so they come over and they sit on the land and they're all sort of hugging you and things. So, um, but yeah, like, yeah, it's a big journey for them too. It's a big journey for my parents as well, you know. So, you know, your 16-year-old has just sort of met Jesus for the first time and starting a new life. But um, yeah, it's a massive journey for them as well. I love it. Thank you for sharing your story. I will let you off the hook. Um, what I love is that this room is full of stories like that, people who meet Jesus who are radically different. And the question I have for you tonight is this, if you were the only version of Jesus that people ever saw, what would they say about your life? If you're the only Jesus that people come into contact with, what are they saying about the way you are at work? What are they saying about the way that you are on a Friday night after youth? What are they saying about you in the way that you talk to your spouse or your kids? What are they saying about you on, at the way you conduct yourself at graduation parties on a Friday night after graduation? What are people saying about you if you're the only Jesus that they're gonna to get to see in their life? Would you be good for Jesus' reputation or would you be bad for it? And tonight, with that in mind, we're gonna talk about belonging and we're gonna talk about baptism. That's why the pool's open. I'm a Baptist from way back, so this night makes my heart happy. You see, baptism is one of the very clear indicators that you belong in the community of faith. Jesus commanded it as one of the first signs that a person had chosen to follow Him. So I bet you, if I had have asked Al after he decided to follow Jesus, it wasn't too much after that that he decided to get baptised. You see, Jesus himself was baptised in the rivers of Jordan by John, even though he had never been sinful. And then he said to all of the disciples coming after him, you have to do the same thing. It was the last instruction that he left with his disciples too. In Matthew 28, 18, he says something quite remarkable. He says this, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I will be with you until the very end of the age. Do you know, I get why Jesus would say, go teach them, show them all my teachings, make sure they understand everything that I've said. But Jesus starts with this, go baptise them. Obviously for Jesus, baptism means something significant, that it's an anchor point and a reference point for our faith. And tonight we're gonna to look at why it is so important for followers of Jesus, not just for the guys that are getting baptised tonight, but for any of you who have already been baptised. I am believing that tonight is gonna to be so significant for you as you understand why it is that Paul in Romans points us back to our baptism over and again and tells us to remember it. He's dealing in Rome with Christians who have lost their way. And as he deals with them, one of the chief mechanisms he uses to go, hey, you gotta get back on target, get back in the game, is by talking to them about their own baptism. In just a few verses, Paul gives really succinct meaning to what baptism is and why it matters to you and me. And so I'm gonna pray for us really quickly that God would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what He is saying. So Father, tonight I pray that as we open Your Word, that You would give us understanding and wisdom and revelation. I pray God that You would ignite in us an excitement again for who You are and what You're doing in our lives. Lord, that You would give us the courage to face each day with Your strength, and tenacity to stand firm in the face of opposition. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in Your sight, in Jesus' Name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Okay, why don't you turn with me to Romans 6. And while you do, 
Um, Rich and I have lived in Sydney for 26 years. We come from Melbourne, which is why yesterday when we were watching the grand final, I could not side with my father and Barrett for the Sydney Swans. I was definitely going for Geelong. We won, guys. We won. I'm a Carlton supporter. Rich is a Collingwood supporter. We love Melbourne with all of our hearts. We have lived in Sydney longer than we've ever lived in Melbourne. But if you ask my kids where they come from, they'll tell you they come from Melbourne, even though they were born at the sand. It makes no sense. But we are Melburnians through and through. It might be because it's a cooler city than Sydney. It's true, right? Better restaurants, better coffee, better people. All right, maybe not. <laughs> I... I love get baptized. Okay, guys, I repent of my sin. I don't know why it is, but there's something about Melbourne that always has my heart. It's where I grew up. It's the good old days. It's familiar. When we go home, we have friends who we have been friends with since I was in primary school. We have dinner. It's like reminiscing from the old. It is so good. I love what was. Sometimes a little bit too much. In fact, I can remember going back to Melbourne at one point in time, you get this for free. And I felt like the Lord said, as we were driving out of Melbourne, I was telling Him how much I loved it. So you wanna go back to Egypt. Oh. Yeah, that's for free, has nothing to do with this. But we love what is old and familiar and comfortable, right? And it's not just me. I have a global acting interim senior pastor on the front row who told you all about his love affair with 1927 last week. Guys, it's a band from the 90s. They're not that good and they had one hit. If you look and you've been singing it or they had two hits, sorry guys, two hits. If you look around this room, I'm sure you'll notice that there are hairstyles from the 90s. There are people who have not made the change from Foxtel to streaming services. Some of you, were at the formal that I was at on Friday night and you were singing Rick Astley at the top of your lungs, but as soon as anything current came on, you went back to your seats. And it's not just us old guys that do that. Apparently you Gen Z guys, you watch movies that you've seen before because you like the predictability of the ending over watching new films. You like what is old and comfortable too. And it could just be that there is comfort for us in what is familiar. And that even though old things can sometimes be irritating or out of date or irrelevant, we tend to go back there and drift back there because it is comfortable for us. I don't know if it's laziness or it's loyalty, but there is an attraction with that, like a mangy pair of slippers that fit well. And that is what is going on in the letter to Romans where Paul is talking to a bunch of Christians. They're finding their new life in Christ difficult. Actually, they're finding it too hard and they wanna gravitate back there pretty quickly. In chapter six, it says this in the opening. So what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died for sin. Therefore, how can we live in it any longer? You know, in Rome, there is this incredible thought that people are shamelessly addicted to their own lives. And they start to perpetuate this thought, God's gracious. Actually, God's so gracious that if I keep sinning, His grace is so big that it can cover my sin. And therefore, the more I sin, the more I'm forgiven, the more blessed I am. It sounds crazy, right? But it's kind of like when we go shopping. I don't know about you, but if there's a sale on for clothes, I can justify that 50% off means I can buy two things. <laughs> and maybe if it's 75% off, I can get three things. And the more red tickets there are on things, the more money I'm saving rich by buying things on sale, the more things I can buy and the better off we will be. And in fact, if I buy enough things, one day I will have saved enough money that I can stop working because of the money that we have. Ridiculous logic, right? This is stupid. But that is exactly what's happening in Rome with these guys. They're saying, he has to forgive me. He's gracious. And so Paul comes in really decisively and he says something to the church. And I think he would say it to us tonight. He reminds them of who they are. 
He says this, we are those who have died to sin. We died to sin, church. So how can we live in that any longer? I just wanna be clear here. Paul's not saying to the church that they're never gonna sin again. He's talking about a state of dying to sin where we relinquish the control and the power that sin had to actually govern our choices. For all of you here tonight, you will understand what that looks like if you're honest. I think about things like lying or gossip or issues with anger, things that we can probably all relate to. Paul's saying here, God's healed me from the power of control that that has over me. And therefore, I'm able to choose differently when it comes to facing sin because of what Jesus has done for me. It is the same for us tonight. We have, as Jesus' followers, power to choose transformation. Power to choose transformation. And you know where it begins? It begins right here tonight in this baptismal pool. It began when you were baptised, if you've already been baptised, and it will begin again for those people wearing shirts like mine who are getting baptised tonight. I wanna read to you the rest of those verses from Romans and then notice three quick things before we actually meet some of our friends who are being baptised. It says this, or don't you know, all of us who were baptised into Christ were baptised into His death. We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now this is good news. And I wanna tell you three things here that I notice about baptism because Paul is saying for all of us who were baptised into Christ, first thing that you need to know about baptism tonight is that it is for everyone. Baptism is for everyone. Don't you know that all of us were baptised into Jesus Christ? If I was Judah Smith, I would say, I looked up all in the Greek and you know what it said? Oh, gee guys, you know this one well. Anyway, it is a fair assumption for Paul to make that baptism is for everyone because Jesus was baptised. And it is significant because the Christmas narrative is told in two Gospels by His baptism in all four. This is significant for the church. All of His disciples were baptised. Jesus commanded anyone who followed Him to be baptised. And if you look through the book of Acts, you find that any juncture where people encounter Jesus, the very next thing they do is to get baptised. And I'm gonna give you some notes to look at, but at the end of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, that we love to quote so much about the outpouring of the Spirit, what the action actually was, was that he implored people to follow Christ and to respond this way. Those who accepted his message in verse 41 of Acts 2 were baptised and 3,000 were added to their number that day. We're probably not gonna baptise 3,000 people tonight, but gee, I would love it if we did. And the same thing happens the whole way through Acts. When Simon the sorcerer finds Jesus, the first thing they do is it says, but when he believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news, they were all baptised, men and women, and Simon himself believed and was baptised. An Ethiopian eunuch is baptised in chapter eight. In chapter nine, it's the Apostle Paul. In 10, it's Cornelius. In 16, it is a Philippian jailer and his whole family. And all through Acts, And through 2000 years of church history, baptism is the core part of believing and following Jesus. If you've been baptised in here tonight, why don't you put your hand up? Who's been baptised? Yes, see, look at us. It's awesome. Whenever people came to Jesus, baptism was the first symbol. In the New Testament, Hayden talked about it the other day, but Jesus was never called Lord. Caesar was Lord. And it was a common greeting of all the people in the New Testament, but baptism was the declaration that Lordship had changed. And the Christians weren't bound by their allegiance to Caesar, but their allegiance to Jesus Christ. The second thing that you note in these verses is that baptism has the power to deal with our sin. It says, therefore, we are buried with Him through the baptism into death. This is a line in the sand. You know, tonight, is both a funeral service and a celebration service. This is a symbol that as you go into the waters, that you leave your old life behind, that you leave your sinful nature behind, that you are dead to that and you become alive to Christ. This is a public declaration of faith. And there are a lot of people who would say that they are fans of Jesus. They like His teaching, they like to observe what He's doing. They think what He does is awesome. But followers of Jesus, 
people who cast their lots with Him and who are all in. They're people who are baptised. People who do strange rituals to become part of a strange community where we're known by our love for each other and for the world that makes no sense. Yeah, some sin is really hard to let go of. Whether it's gossip or lust or jealousy or pride or apathy or anger or drugs or alcohol or gambling or slander. And you know what poison it is that you drink and where your own sin is. You don't get rid of sin easily. So when Paul says that we're buried with Jesus through death, he's not speaking about physical death. He's speaking about the beginning of a process. That this is only the start. This isn't where everything ends. It's a process of choice and of will and a process of publicly and privately choosing Jesus Christ rather than many attractive other alternatives. And that's why Paul defines baptism not as choosing death to sin reigns in our life, but by defining it by new life in Christ. So he is more excited about what happens to us out the other side of this pool than in our death to sin. And then finally, baptism proclaims new life in Christ. This is where it gets really good, guys. It says, just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, that we too may have new life. This is literally a metaphor for dying and then being raised to life with Christ. This is an anchor point that all of us are meant to look back to and remember. Jesus, when He talked about baptism, knew that you and I were much better with a picture in our head that reminded us of a moment in time than merely a tick box that said we'd done something. This is meant to remind you of a decision that you made and that you continue to make daily that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. And here's the thing, baptism, the word in Greek is baptizo. And it hasn't really changed from English, but it means three things. And these three things are important for you to know. The first thing is a physical thing. The second thing is a spiritual thing. And the third thing is an act of your will, a volition. The first word for baptism means this. It means to dip repeatedly, to immerse or submerge. In the Greek, they used it for ships that had sunk at sea. Physically tonight, baptism is that you will go under the water, that you'll actually be immersed under the water. Second thing, that's a physical thing. The second thing is a spiritual thing. And baptizo also means to cleanse, to wash clean with water, to bathe. And that's where this is a spiritual act. What happens tonight is that your spirit is washed clean. That something about this process in identifying with the death of Jesus, you remind yourself that on the cross, His blood spilt for you, washed you clean. And so there is something spiritual that happens tonight in that pool. And then the other thing that I think is really cool, there's a third meaning and it's this, means to overwhelm. And that's where I think this is an act of will. When we're baptised into Christ, we invite His life to overwhelm our life, His Spirit to overwhelm ours, His forgiveness to overwhelm our sin, His love to overwhelm our fear, His compassion to overwhelm our apathy, His self-control to overwhelm us, His gentleness, His patience and His righteousness. This is a good night. This is a night of hope and life and celebration as a community. This is a night where any of you who say this is your church, you get new brothers and sisters in Christ. It is old school and it is awesome because there is something about what is happening tonight that means we stand in solidarity with each other. We link arms and we choose to do life together. We choose to encourage each other on in faith and in commitment to Jesus Christ. But tonight isn't just about the people being baptised. You know, Paul is desperate in Romans to remind Christians that their baptism is significant for the daily outworking of their faith. This is meant to remind you that you have the power of Christ to overcome if you have been baptised. And so if you are standing here, sitting here tonight and you have been baptised, I wanna ask you to recall to memory your baptism. Can you remember when you got baptised? I was so excited. I got 1 Corinthians 15, 58 as my baptismal verse. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know your labour is not in vain. 
I loved Jesus. I was so grateful for what He had done for me. And this afternoon when I started to think about recalling my baptism, I went, oh, do I still have that level of faith and expectation and confidence in who God is and what He can do? How about you? How's it going for you remembering your baptism and living in the fullness of life that Christ has called you to? And there's a second group of people. And there are people here tonight and you have actually decided to follow Jesus. You came down the front on an altar call, you gave your life to Him and yet you haven't been baptised yet. And I'd like to encourage you tonight, if that is you, Jesus commands us to follow Him in baptism. There's some really amazing verses in the Bible about it and stories. And it would be pretty cool if next time we ran a baptismal night, you put your name down and we were cheering for you on the side. And this place, maybe we do baptise 3,000 people because there are so many of you probably who have reasons why you don't wanna get in there. And I understand that. But we're not asking you to get baptised, Jesus is. And then there are the people tonight who have made a courageous decision to follow Jesus in baptism. And if that's you, I'm gonna ask you now if you'll begin to move down to the front. Because tonight you've decided to draw a line in the sand and you've decided that you are gonna follow Jesus. And we are excited as your Christian community and your family. And we're gonna be the ones praying for you and cheering for you and loving you as you get baptised. And while they come, I just thought tonight, it could be really amazing if you got to hear just a couple of the stories of the people who are choosing to follow Jesus and to be baptised. And so Tyler Douglas, I wonder if you would introduce us to your friend. Yes, well, hope you're doing well. Um, this is my good friend, Lockie Halimic. Can everyone say hi, Lockie? You can say hi back to everybody. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, okay, so before we get into the reason you're being baptised tonight and why you're making this decision, would you like to tell people where you serve in our church? Uh, yeah, um, so I am an RDG leader for, uh, at a Green Tribe Fuel. Green Tribe Fuel. Having the absolute honour of serving the Year 7 boys. And yeah, love them. So good. What's your favourite thing about serving those Year 7 boys in our youth ministry? Ooh. Probably just the community and just the fact that I get to give back to the youth ministry that once sewn into me. So good. So, yeah. It's an awesome answer, Lucky. Um, okay, when did you meet Jesus? Uh, it was, so I was 10. It was at a C3 church conference, actually. It was the last night and they had the thing at the end that they do every week. And um, yeah, so just during that moment, it just felt so instinctual. Like I didn't second guess my thoughts or anything. So like, it just felt so right at that time. So yeah, I just went for it and yeah, changed my life ever since. So good. Can we get up for Lockie just for telling us that? Um, two more questions. Um, how has that decision impacted your life? Ooh, okay, um, probably the biggest thing is that uh, Jesus has enabled me to, I guess, stay true to myself um, and His Word like I guess through life's adversities or like temptations, which is like a huge thing because like, so I just finished high school, well not just finished, it was like I graduated last year, but I feel like high school is the toughest time for young people because that's when they are most vulnerable to I guess things that sometimes that don't line up, like line up with God's word. But um, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, so like the person that I have become today is a miracle in itself because if it wasn't for Jesus, I don't know where I would have, I guess, gone or finished up. But yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. So good, man. And then, um, yeah, we can give him a round of applause as well. And then lastly, um, so tell us why you're getting baptised tonight. Okay, um, so currently I'm, I guess, in a season of visions, I guess, visions for myself, like goals and ambitions, and I guess visions for the for the young people that I lead and the youth ministry. And so I just thought that, I guess, a rebirth in my faith through baptism is, I guess, like the cornerstone to creating God-centered visions. And so, yeah, that's why I've made my decision. So awesome. Can we get up for Lockie? It's an awesome decision and we are pumped to be standing with you tonight. Back to you, Cass. Okay, and I asked Junior if he would maybe introduce us to some friends that he has. Yes, give it up. This is Meet Todd. Come on, church. Let's put our hands together for Todd here. Thanks, church. All right, Todd, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you met Jesus? 
Yeah, JT, it was back in 2009, the first time I came into the 180 program. And um, yeah, back in 2009, yeah. And I would love to know how has he changed your life? How has Jesus changed your life since to this day? Jesus saved my life, mate. That's no means an exaggeration. Mate, during the first time in the program, I started a relationship with Jesus, but I left the program thinking that I was ready to live free from addiction. Um, but I wasn't, mate. As the years went on, I was out in and out of addiction, getting in trouble with the law, causing a whole lot of trouble and pain and suffering to my lovely family. Um, uh, I came to 180 TC earlier this year, but on a weekend leave, I relapsed, got arrested and got sent to prison. Um, I served three months of an 18-month sentence. Thanks to you, JT, and the 180 team and all the crew and that, you've given me another chance. And my beautiful mother, give me another chance at restoration, mate. And um, yeah, the 180 CC. Come on, let's give it our hands together for Todd. What an incredible story. And I would love to ask, because you've got your daughter here. I Michaela, do. Michaela. This is beautiful and Michaela. Joanne. This is my beautiful mum. I've been, yeah. I haven't seen Michaela in six months. And um, we've been reunited tonight for the first time. I Come on. You. Isn't that wonderful? I love you. And lastly, Todd. Oh, this is awesome. <laughs> How special. Yeah. <laughs> I love you. And lastly, Todd, um, mate, I would love to know, and I think our church would love to know, why making the decision to be baptised tonight? Mate, I just want to bury my past. You know, I'm a man of God, and, you know, I've fallen away from him, and I'd, that's not me no more, you know. I'm, I'm better than that, and I've got to be a father to my beautiful kids, you know. I've just got to step up and wash all that away and start being the man, like a real man. Come on, let's give it up. Todd Jones. I'd just like oh, to shit. thank um, JT. i just like to thank all the 180 boys and, and the 180 girls. Yeah. He's just doing an awesome job. And to the people who donate to 180, the 180TC program, thank you very much. Awesome. It's for a good cause. Thank you. Great. I've got another friend here. Hello. Say hello to Jessica. Hi, everyone. This is good Jess. Evening. How are you feeling? You good? I'm nervous sided. Yeah. That's, that's how we're. <laughs> <laughs> how did you meet Jesus? Why don't you um, share a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I've been a Christian for my whole life. Basically, I was born and raised in church, and my um, relationship with Him has just developed over time. And tonight, obviously, huge decision. And you've got a whole church family that are going to be cheering you on. But most importantly as well, you've got your whole family here. Come on, let's give it up for the family. They're here joining, supporting Jessica tonight. I've just got two quick questions for you, Jess. How has Jesus changed your life? Um, I owe everything that I am to God and to Jesus. He is my all and everything. And... Um, like Todd said too, we wouldn't be alive and that's legitimate when we say that because he's just brought us through so much over, over the years. So yeah, just everything and all. Amazing. Come on, let's give it up for Jess. Incredible. And lastly, Jess, why getting baptised tonight? Um, so for the last five years, I've been heavily in addiction as well. Um, entered the 180TC program at the start of January. Um, I've been baptised twice before and my daughter <laughs> said basically third time's going to work, Mum. So, yeah, <laughs> believe in that. Um, but yeah, just um, it's been a really like serious and tough season in the last five years for all of us. So I'm just so blessed and honoured to have these guys here. Um, through it all. Um, I'm just claiming Jesus Christ's victory tonight and his overcoming power for our lives. Um, I'm also taking that stake hold and taking um, a standing in place for my three, that they will never have to experience addiction 
in their lives. Um, I'm severing the ties of addiction and any, everything can it, that it's associated with. And, uh, yeah. and laying to rest in that watery grave, the old, the old Jess and walking out into freedom. Yeah, Amazing, come on so, one more amen. time. Can we give that for Jess? Thank you for Thank you. sharing your story with us tonight. And Todd, back to you Beautiful, guys. so church, why don't you stand to your feet with us and Pastor Phil's gonna come and pray for the guys who are being baptised. And we're gonna worship with them and we're gonna celebrate a God who saves and a community who loves. How beautiful. I, I, Todd, where's Todd? You, you can't do that to us. Like I'm there trying to, you know, listen to your story. Next thing, like I'm a mess. You got your beautiful daughter there. You got your mum there. I mean, it's just what a special moment, hey? And uh, honoured that we can be a part of it and hearing Chester's story as well. Church, this is the reality of what we're about. You know, our faith isn't a moment. Our faith is a transformation of our hearts that changes our lives. And we believe changes them for all eternity. And uh, this moment is such a significant moment. As Cass so beautifully and clearly articulated, uh, that this is a moment of leaving the old life behind and a moment of coming up brand new because of Jesus. Not because of anything I can do, but simply because I've said in my heart, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me, give me a brand new start. And that's what happens in this moment. If you have not been baptised, why don't you consider it? Um, pray about it, because we do this regularly. And uh, it really is a significant step in your faith journey. Uh, to be baptised. And so this is a really powerful moment and uh, honoured that I can pray. Who is getting baptised? Just give us a wave, everyone around here. Um, let's put our hands together for all these guys. Can I just say this as well? It's not too late. Uh, if someone wants to join the end of the line, um, I'm sure we can organise T-shirt, shorts, all of that. Maybe you go home, you arrive dry, you're gonna go home wet, but it'll be a spiritual change. Uh, that is really what it's all about. So you, you're welcome if you wanna get baptised, but we're gonna pray in this moment, and then we're gonna hand back to Cass. Uh, let's pray for these guys. Father, we just thank You for every one of these men and women who are making this step of faith. Uh, Lord, that they right now would know the love of their Heavenly Father, just overwhelming them. As they, they make this, this statement, uh, Lord, they are leaving the old life behind. As Jess said, that old life is being left behind. We come out of this water brand, brand new, brand new because of Jesus, a new life through Christ. Lord, we speak it over every one of these men and women that there will be something new that will happen out of this moment. Something new in their relationship with You. Some, something with regard to their, the strength of their walk with You. Their, their eyes will be lifted higher to see with greater vision the call that You have for them, the vision, the purpose You've placed on their lives. May this moment be such a powerful moment as the Holy Spirit of God is upon them, we pray in Jesus' Name. And everyone said, Amen. Come on, let's congratulate these guys one more time.
Can we really just applaud everyone and congratulate everyone making that public declaration of uh, leaving the past behind and stepping into the brand new. And, and a big thank you to those of you that courageously also shared your testimony as well, which is just um, absolutely amazing. I think we also need to thank Cass Langton for such a phenomenal teaching. So beautiful. Thank you, Cass. But hey, um, just as we draw towards the conclusion uh, of this service, I wanted to give people just a, a moment to reflect, reflect on your own individual lives and a moment to reflect upon where you stand when it comes to knowing Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. Because we wanna give you a moment as well to respond. And this is between you and, and God. This is not between you and the person next to you, but my question is this, do you know Jesus? Do you know Him as your Lord and Saviour? Have you accepted Him into your life? Is He your everything? Maybe you've never prayed this prayer that I would love to lead you in. 
Maybe you've never prayed a prayer to ask Jesus into your life. Or maybe it, you have. But at one time in your life, you, you know that you, uh, since that time, since that prayer, you drifted, you walked away. I love that He's a God that never walks away from the mess. He doesn't walk away when we seem to drift. He's there in the middle of it and He's right with you. But sometimes maybe you need to turn around and recognise that He is there. And so I'd love to lead those of you who have never made a decision to follow Jesus. In a moment, I'm gonna allow people to respond. I'm gonna ask people in a moment to close their eyes. And if you're saying, yeah, Peter, would you lead me in this prayer you're about to pray of knowing Jesus? I wanna know Him. Friend, I'd love to lead you in this prayer. He loves you so much. He didn't let sin, He didn't let mistakes separate us. He didn't allow that to be the gap that stood in between who, where we were and where He was. He closed that gap by sending His Son, Jesus, to die for each and every one of us. For the Bible says that we've all missed the target. We've all missed the mark. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, but in His goodness and His grace, He gave everything to save you, to rescue you, to bring you back home. And maybe today is that day where you make a decision to follow Him. Can I have every head bowed, every eye closed all over this place? If you're saying, yeah, Peter, would you lead me in this prayer? You're about to pray. I'll include you in this prayer. Whoever I'm speaking to from the youngest to the oldest, from the front to the back, left to the right, those online, those in the parenting room, do you know Him? If you don't, here's your moment to respond to who He is. Are you ready? I'm gonna count to three. When I get to three, I want you to raise your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it while no one's looking around. You ready? One, two, three. All over this place, raise your hands. Beautiful on the floor, throughout the building here. Wow, many people responding. Beautiful, beautiful. So cool. God's doing something in this place. Wow. I'm sure people online responding. Beautiful. You can put your hands down. Church, can we please give it up for these people who have made this decision? So cool. There's one more thing. We're going to, Say a prayer and don't worry, we're not gonna get you to say it by yourself. We're one big family. We're gonna say this together, okay? So church, let's say this together. But if you raise your hand, I want you to say this from the bottom of your heart, okay? You're praying this to God. He listens, He hears you right now. So come on, let's all pray this together. Dear Jesus, today I surrender all. I give You my life. Forgive me of all my wrongdoing. I choose You. Lead me, guide me. I need Your help. In Jesus' Name, Amen, Amen, Amen. Come on, church. Let's really congratulate many people that I saw in this room here. And listen, there's a next step you can take from here. And listen, when this service uh, concludes, when the um, the doors open and you go out to different exit foyers, uh, someone's gonna be waving this Bible around. They're waving it around because they're hoping that they'll get your attention if you prayed that prayer. They're hoping that you'll start a conversation with them. Listen, this is a gift that they're waiting to give you. Our team are waiting to give you to mark this day where you decided to follow Jesus. But more than that even is that they want to have a conversation with you to get you help and get you started on this journey. And that's the beautiful thing about salvation. It's a journey. It's a journey of becoming like Him, of knowing Him more. And we've got things called connect groups and things that we we, we wanna help you be discipled by Jesus. And that happens in a community of like-minded people who wanna know Him. So throughout the week, make sure you you ask questions, but that conversation starts when you receive this gift. And please take this gift. It's, uh, it's, It's our gift to you to mark this day, okay? So one more time, church, let's applaud everyone making that decision.